But I think one of the reasons why these people have this deep-seated anger and resentment is there's a bunch of people out there that have these lives that are deeply unsatisfying because I think somehow or another through momentum and just through just things falling into place the way they are and people trying to fit their lives around the way these pieces have fallen into place, there are so many people that are working all day long doing something that is deeply unsatisfying and and almost painful yeah, to them. Yeah, soul killing. Soul killing. They're yeah. stuck in traffic all day and then they're stuck in a cubicle after that. They 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 relish the time to take a shit in the bathroom and look at their phone. I mean, they literally do that. That's a, a highlight of someone's day. They get in traffic on the way home. They get home after that, they're watching television and they're fucked. They have Deep debt. This is not like there's this soul killing no, thing is not the, giving the, them any freedom. The debt's huge, dude. And, and you know what? You, you sit there and go, and you look at what people make, and you sit there and go, you can make quite a lot of money by average Joe's standards and still not be in good shape. And so, no. some, so I know people turn around, make good living, really good living, and turn around and go, I'm just holding my head above water. Yeah. Right? And so you go, okay, if you're holding your head just barely, what's a person making a third or a quarter of what you're making doing? I mean, this is really, when you talk about revolutions happening and, 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 and things going down in weird, unpredictable, negative ways, you and we've talked about this before. You let enough of your society fall into the loser class, for lack of a better word, winners and losers in society. If you, every society can suck up a certain amount of people not able to to make it. But if that number gets large enough, revolutions happen. I think so too. But I think the revolution doesn't necessarily have to be violent. I think the revolution can be a revolution of action and ideas. And I think that there's a ton of people out there that are probably listening to this that would like to be able to do something else. Absolutely. Whether it's make furniture. Well, they don't want a revolution. In, right. They want to do something that's not soul yeah, killing. If, yes. you're, if you make furniture, you make furniture for a living, and you, you feel a great satisfaction out of that, and you sell that furniture, look, man, for making furniture feels good. If you can do that, you could you could cut those corners perfectly and sand everything down nice and stain it, and then it's done, and you get this satisfaction, and you sell it to someone, and that pays your bills. That is infinitely more satisfying than being stuck in some fucking cubicle working for someone that you don't want to work for, having to have these stupid fucking office meetings, talking to people in human resources, sitting down with your supervisor where they evaluate your job performance. And, you know, you're not really, you know, you, you really need to be enthusiastic about this company. This company is your future. This kind of like, and you're like, fuck, kill me now. You know, there's a lot of people out there that would way rather do something else. And I hope they understand that they can. That's let's talk things. about that because we, we we're in yeah, that we're in that please. subject because we've been talking about us and podcasting and new media and whatever. But but really, and I tell I give I rarely like to give advice because you know you don't want to you don't want to be responsible for people acting on it and having it not turn out well. But what I tell people is two things. Right now, the United States of America, the way it's built, is built to help industry and 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 corporations and and companies. But that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be Microsoft. It can be you. Right. Yeah, you can um, have your own thing. And, and the, let's talk about the furniture builder. Once upon a time, there are huge things in your way, including needing to get loans and all these other things to just start a business. So you're behind the eight ball right away, and the pressure's on because if it doesn't work, you're in debt. Whereas, I mean, we started these podcasts. There's no brick or mortar. I mean, now you've got just the, the, the Rogan Tower. It's a little bit different. But once upon a time, it's like in the back of your bedroom, and you've got a company, and it's got a show, and people are listening. If you make your furniture, and you don't have to have a brick and mortar store, but you can put a website up, uh, make it with Squarespace or one of those other things, and all of a sudden you have a business out of your house, the freedom, the satisfaction, the ability to set your own hours, and here's the best part, the fact that if you start making a lot of money somehow, you're not going to have your boss cut your commissions. I mean, I knew sales guys who made so much money that their bosses cut their commissions because you can't make more than your bosses. Well, listen, when you have your own small business, the sky's the limit. If you make $10 million, you make $10 million. Yeah. So I always tell people that if you can, and it's not always something they can do, maybe you do it on the side when you've got your regular job, starting a small business now in this climate that we have right now is not only possible – it's not that much of a gamble because if worse comes to worse, you didn't invest a hundred thousand dollars you didn't have starting it all the time, right? Yeah. I mean that website didn't cost you that much. You know the the investment for the tools you may have had already. Podcasting is a perfect example. We make business like my buddy says. We sell zeros and ones. Yeah. That's what we do. Well, it's been never been easier to have a website either. No. Easier with companies like Squarespace, you could develop a website. You could literally build amazing website Se in a and fucking sell hour. your furniture, and you right? have a free online store with it, and you you put you, they have these 
these drag and drop user interfaces. You use photos, you drag them onto there, size it in place, boom. Next thing you know, you've got a website. Sell your furniture, sell whatever the fuck you make, whether you make clothes or you're designing backpacks or there's there's a lot of people out there that have interests and they've never pursued those interests because they're fucking tired from doing they're some tired, boring, yes. soul-sucking It's job. hard to go to work and, and put your effort into that and then come home and then work for yourself. It's yeah. very hard. But I'll tell you what, there's there's a part, like you said, there's a part of it that once you start making stuff for yourself, that's self-motivating, right? It, like um, I told somebody to start a podcast and I said, the first time you get some feedback email, that will kick you in the rear end to keep doing the podcast. It, it becomes, it becomes um, you know, life is a verb, I always say, and you have to actually act. But by acting, you change everything in your future. Um, another guy said to me, it's a great line, he said, with podcasts, it's not always how many people are listening. Sometimes it's who they are, mm. right? So my grandmother's philosophy was always that you should keep walking and talking. But in her era, walking and talking meant going and shaking people's hands. And now you can network like through the internet and you never are really shaking people's hands but you may have a podcast with only a hundred listeners but if one of those listeners is some guy somewhere else who says oh my god this guy's furniture is great or whatever i'm yeah. gonna i'm gonna maybe you can come and start giving a pottery barn you know what okay i mean things open up in ways that you can't predict because you started doing something and because you have legitimate passion for what you're yes. doing that resonates doesn't with people feel that like experience work. that yeah. yeah if they see fun i mean i can't tell you how many artists that i've discovered online just through instagram or through Twitter, like oh, this is an, send me it's a, a creative revolution. Yes, yeah. in a, in an amazing way, and I I hope and I think there's way more creative people out there than we realize. Oh yes, absolutely. And I think they would love to have some sort of an opportunity to do something like that, and especially like an artist, someone who's an artist. Man, there's never been a better time to be an artist because you could showcase your work and and, and look if you send me something cool and I, you know you send it to me on Twitter and I'll You'll fucking retweet, retweet yeah, it. Yeah, totally. I can re retweet things all the time, mm -hmm. and all that takes is someone. Else Else has to see that and say, "Wow, that's amazing!" And then do, 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 it just propagates to all these different people's Instagram feeds and all these people's Twitter feeds. And next thing you know, you've got a business mm -hmm. and you're up and running. And it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be quick. But, but the neither, job you're doing now right. ain't easier, yeah. quickie. The soul killing one ain't easier, quickie. But either. people think like, "Oh, how long is that going to take?" Oh, but we, you know, when you start out doing a podcast, well, only got ten downloads. Well, that's how it works. Next we week, all were there once. Yeah, I was there once. <laughs> Dude, when we first did it, when, we, we, when Brian and I were first doing this podcast and we were doing it on like Ustream, we would have 200 viewers. And I wasn't doing it for money. I, wasn't, I, were, we're, I was literally doing it because my, my wife had gotten pregnant. We had to move from Colorado back to L.A. and I was bummed out. I was like, fuck, I thought I escaped. <laughs> I, th I thought I got out of L.A. I was living in the mountains. I was like, this is what I want. I want to be in nature. I was like, I don't want to be back in this fucking hellhole. I'm like, all right, let's do something. And so we started doing podcasts just for a goof because I was doing stand-up. That was all well and good. But look at how it tied into your stand-up so nicely. Yeah, you well, know? but it start my point is, it didn't start out, I didn't start out thinking, this is going to replace my income. This is going to be, I just did it as a passion project. And I think if people have a regular day job, if you could just find some one thing that you do as a passion project and just keep building on it, just keep at, keep watering it, keep adding fertilizer, keep giving it attention, keep giving it focus, and you can escape. You can escape, and you can be self-serving. You could be okay. You're going to be okay. I always ask people when they want to start it, I, like a podcast, I'll say something like, how many listeners would you have to have for you to care? Right. Yeah. What, what's and that's a magic number that's different for everybody, right? But but what what's great about what we do that's different from broadcasting is that there is a giant pie of people. Let's pretend it's a billion. And if you're going to do a podcast on science fiction comic books from the 1950s or something that, yeah. that has such a narrow audience, they'd never put it on television because it's it's too narrow. You will be able if you even get point oh 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 one percent of that billion pie. It's not only going to be a decent number of people in terms of what you would think is successful, but they are going to be so enthusiastic because this is an outlet that they don't have. It's like I, I always tell somebody, if you're into Harry Potter, what are the TV networks giving you? But yeah. there's multiple Harry Potter podcasts. Listen and, to this. You want to yeah. hear something crazy? Sure. Time Magazine just had some top 50 podcast thing, and uh, a buddy of mine who was angry that he wasn't on sent me some stuff about it. And uh, one of the things he said, dude, there's a fucking podcast on there called The Gilmore Boys. That's guys, <laughs> two guys sitting around talking about the Gilmore Girls television show. There's another one called uh, something about Richard Simmons where there's 
Finding people, Richard Simmons. Finding right? Richard yeah. Simmons, where they're trying to figure out why Richard Simmons went into hiding. What's so great about that idea, though, and again, and you at home can learn this, too. What's so great about that idea is that they instantly tied their podcast to somebody who already had tons of fans. Yes. Right? So you sit there and go, I don't know who these guys are or what this podcast, but I'm a huge Richard Simmons fan, so I'll listen. And that's like instant audience, isn't it? And there's it? another podcast called, called Guys We Fucked. These girls uh, came up with this podcast. This is one that I always use in this example because these – who are the girls from Guys We Fucked? You see, find their names. Um, these uh, comedians from New York, they came – and they're actually going to be on the podcast Monday. Um, Ooh, that was a clever tie-in. I didn't mean to. But <laughs> I used them as an example because cause we just did, did, booked this the other, uh, earlier today. Christina Hutchinson and Corinne <clears> – <throat> excuse me, Corinne Fisher. And they came up with this clever idea for the title – and it became huge. I mean, it's always top 10. It's like one of the top 10 comedy podcasts. And people say, oh, well, today it's saturated. No, it's not stupid. You just, just do something that's good. Stop saying it's saturated. If you're good, it'll stand out. This idea that, like, oh, it's easy for you to say. Everybody's got these stupid barriers they put in their own head. you got to resist those goddamn things because they don't do you any good. And they certainly define the potential for your future in a negative way that's not self-serving. And it's not even real. You know, you, 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 you put this artificial ceiling on the potential for what you're doing. If you hit a wall, okay, that just means you need to regroup and rethink. It doesn't mean that wall's there, especially when it comes to something like social media or like a, a podcast, something where you're just you're putting out a piece of art. You're putting out something that you've created. There's no wall as far as, like, how many people are going to enjoy it or how far it's going to go. It's just it is what it is, and if people don't like it, make it better. If they like it less, fix that. F figure out a way to do it. You can do that. And this this idea that there's no way to get past the starting block today is just ludicrous. It's crazy. And it's just this this poor thinking. And people that are trapped in bad situations, one of the problems is you feel like this is your future. You feel like you're fucked and you can't get out of that. There's no hope. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. There's no rainbow. And if you feel like that, that alone can be incredibly defining and limiting. But if you can look at, if you look at yourself objectively and say, okay, I kind of am fucked here. I'm in credit card debt. I'm working in a shitty job. I, I, I don't like what I'm doing, but I have some ideas. I need to feed those fucking ideas. And I, fe I, I need to feed them and water them. And I need to set aside a certain amount of time every day to just try to make those things happen. You can do that. I have a, I like visual images. You know, we use that in the hardcore history a lot. These, you know, what's it like to fight an elephant with a spear? Things like that. Oh, I like those. But the, the it's image. It's like to die. That's I, what it's like. <laughs> the, the, the image I have, though, for what you're talking about, I've always thought it's a little like um, a running back in football who takes the ball and who goes forward and there's no hole, right? All you run into is the back of your offensive lineman. But if you keep hitting, if a hole is going to open up, boom, you'll squirt through. Now, there's right. no guarantee in life the hole will be there, but there is a guarantee that if you're not continually smacking at it, then when it opens up, you won't be ready, yes. right? right? And so I don't know about you, Joe. You've had a charmed life, I think, in how well you've done. But, I mean, some of us have failed many times. I've failed um, at a bunch of <laughs> shit. teasing you. I really have. But, but, I mean, but I guess what I'm saying is I remember being a TV reporter at a small station, uh, and, and I would get out of work at like midnight and the sh and the story that I just spent all day on aired and it was awful and I would get out and I would literally this is when I still had quite a bit of hair I would sit there and like you like pull your hair out you go what am I doing right, right? this is horrible and I look back on those now and I think you know what if you had just given up then right uh, or the podcast I mean do you know how my wife did a great thing for me? Uh, we, we, we'd had that company that I just told you about that we were trying to do the new media thing, and it just fell apart like everybody's companies were starting to do. And I'd wasted a lot of time and a lot of money in my life doing that. And she would have been totally justified in saying, that's it. You know, you're going to Indianapolis, get a talk radio show job, wherever they'll hire. But she didn't. She said, you know what? You try, try this next thing. You could do it. You could do it. And here we are. And I think, you know, if you hadn't tried, it's that yeah. weird thing. And folks, I tried being a TV reporter. I tried being, you try all those things and either they're not successful or they're moderately successful or they're successful, but not enough for you. You got, life is a verb. You have to, you know, the, the thing that people, that makes people the most sad in life. And I already have a couple of friends my own age who are there is the regrets, right? They don't, they don't, they're not sorry they failed. They're sorry they didn't try. And the funny mm. thing is, there some of them are only fifty, and they think, okay, my, tr my my window to try is already gone, which is wrong too. 
But folks, you will be so happy. There's so many things that have happened in my life because I, I mean, I got my first talk radio show job. I was, a, I was a reporter. I covered this story. There was some big guy showing up at the local radio station. And as I was leaving, I wrote a letter to the program director to say, thanks for having us. And I thought, do I mail this? Do I not mail it? Do I mail it? Do I? And just, you know, I closed my eyes and I mailed it. He called me two days later. He said, you want a job? What if you didn't right. send that letter? It's right. so stupid. The little things that your life can hinge on. But if you don't do them, you don't give fate an opportunity to intervene. I think here's an important thing, too. Failure is important. It is important. I think failure teaches you things that you don't learn from success. I think failure gives you an opportunity for self-examination and also gives you a feeling that is very uncomfortable. And that very uncomfortable feeling helps you grow. That when you feel like shit and you screw something up, like when I've had bad podcasts, my podcast has always gotten better afterwards. When I've had bad stand-up sets, I've always gotten better after that because those bad sets motivate you. They get they give you a perspective like, hey, here's some clear examples of where you fucked up. Yeah, you what not to do. Yeah, don't and don't look at these failures as like proof that you suck. Look at them as opportunities for growth. Look at them as opportunities to be motivated to do better. And Winston Churchill had a line about reading quotes, about how inspirational reading famous quotes were. Mm. And he says they motivate you from a number of different ways, including the idea that, you know, you think it's just you or you think that these people who did so well were so incredibly gifted or privileged from the get go. And when you realize, no, 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 they're more like me than I think that yeah. becomes inspirational. Right. You telling your audience this is inspirational. You don't want to hear go back to school, go do this work. No. But if you hate your job, that is like nature telling you to try something different. And it's motivating because. The motivation is you might not have to do that soul-killing job anymore. Well, if you look at someone who's doing really well, like say if you focus on like Kevin Hart or someone like that, some very famous and successful comedian, all you see is him now flying around private jets, wearing a new pair of sneakers every day, driving around in Bentleys. You just see that. You don't see him being a young kid in Philadelphia going to open mic nights, scratching and clawing. MC Hammer jokes. selling the, the tapes yeah. out of the hatchback. Yeah. All that stuff, man. There's a path. And you, we, we think of people like you see an old person walking down the street. You go, oh, that person's always been an old person. No, that was a baby. That was a baby that became a 90-year-old man. There's a, there's a progression that you're not witness to. You don't see it. And that, that, that takes place in everything. It takes place in authors. It takes place in comedians and musicians. There is a starting point, and then with time and focus, and as long as you reevaluate and reassess and constantly, objectively look at what you're doing and then pursue it with passion and focus, you get better at things. And you know what? Doing all those things ends up, cre you know, it's funny, but your life experiences create who you are. And all those things actually make you a more formidable, I know I'm speak speaking to the choir here, but, but all those things make you a more formidable person. So that eventually that next endeavor is, is you're more prepared for and you're more formidable. And, and so, you know, you turn around and you say, what was I like as a 23-year-old intern compared to what I'm like now? And I'm basically a different person. Yeah. And you're a different person because of all these life experiences. I mean, you go to a CENTCOM meeting with the big brat, well, you're more <laughs> formidable afterwards, yeah, right? for all, sure. But if you don't put yourself in the position, you know, it's, it's life is like coming up to the, to the plate and taking a swing. There are no guarantees you're going to get a hit, no guarantee, and you might even look foolish swinging, but there's no chance of it if you don't get in the batter's box, right? 100%, and one of the things that I've found over the last few years in particular um, I've done it in the past, but I did it because they were just goals that I was pursuing on the side as well as doing stand-up and all the other things that I do in my life. But I've found that things that are completely unrelated to my career that are difficult enhance what I do. Whether it's mm, yoga, like yoga or running hills or uh, archery or uh, all these things well, that I And you've pursue. managed to incorporate them into yeah, what you do. Yeah, sort of. But that's just because one of the things that I do is just talk about things that I'm interested right. in. But they make my my focus better because they're hard and because i'm not good at them so like when i do yoga i'm not good at yoga so when i do it it's hard it's a fucking struggle and forcing myself to get through that 90 minute class and try a hundred percent with every pose enhances my stamina for thinking and, and approaching other things let's macro it out a little bit because i'm very interested in what you're saying so so here you and i are talking to the listeners uh many of whom are already accomplished and well into their goals but if they're not they're listening to this and i'm thinking to myself okay if you're trying to design a society you know we had talked about revolution if if, if too many people are, are the losers in the society 
if you said to yourself, what really matters in this society is making more Americans who are happier with their lives, more successful, doing what they want to do. In other words, empowering them to, to, to create. Yeah. How different is that in terms of a setup from what our school system is designed to do now, which is a holdover to essentially make good factory workers? Right. Right. I mean, if you said to somebody, listen, this entire country is built for you to become a businessman with your own business, you start your own company. If you taught that in the schools from the get-go and you had workshops all, and, and everybody's gonna say, damn, we already do that in the schools, I already know. But I mean, if that was the entire goal of your education, to turn every student in that class into a small business person doing their own dreams someday, how would you do it differently than what you do now? Because to me, the biggest crime isn't that we have the kind of system we have, it's that we're not, training people on how to utilize it. I mean, we have all these opportunities there, and it sounds like a cliche, but we're doing it. And as you go through it, you say to yourself, well, why can't more people do this? Well, who told them they could? And who said, you know, I mean, this is a little bit of a hand-holding, but I'm teaching this to my kids right now, right? I'm telling them, listen, don't go do the soul-killing job. Uh, work on this thing that you seem to be good at and that you love, and let's work on it now. Yeah. Well, what if the, I mean... I guess what I'm saying is, could we be doing a better job here? Uh, and if, if so, you know, would you have to fight teachers' unions to do it? Would, I mean, what do you have to do to break apart a system that's 140 years old and not working all that well right now to more correspond to the reality that people are growing up in now? Well, I had a conversation with my daughter yesterday about this, my nine-year-old. And uh, she was saying, it, she was saying, she was saying, school is so boring. I don't want to go to school tomorrow. Well, she was laughing about. It. I was picking her up from uh, this class that she goes to, and uh, I said, "Well, what's the most boring?" She goes, "It's all boring." She's being funny, right? Right. And I go, "Well, you like reading, and you, you're you're really into reading." She goes, "Yeah, I I do. I like it, but they make it boring." She goes, "They make reading boring," and she goes, "They make." I go, "But you like writing, right? You like writing?" She goes. I like writing what I want to write about. They yeah, make sure. writing boring. So she's creative. Yeah, but she was being silly. But the wisdom from a nine-year-old, we were just laughing and having fun talking about it, but the wisdom from a nine-year-old expressing how they make things that she likes boring. It's like, I think there's a certain amount that you have to do that's boring, right? There's a certain amount of the hard work. Even in your business that you like. Sure, yeah. learning, learning grammar, learning language. A certain amount of that stuff is fucking boring. Once you get past that boring shit and you have a base understanding of how to communicate, how to add, how to count, how to d d d multiply, how government works, all these different things that you, you should have sort of a base understanding of, then it's like everyone has a different personality. They have different, different interests, different different things that they would be really satisfied pursuing. That's not encouraged. The, the, what's encouraged is go find a job. What's encouraged is go find some place that you can shove yourself into. Go find a square hole that you can stick your round peg and just fucking jam it in there and shave down the top and the bottom so you slide in with all this extra space on the sides and feel like shit for the rest of your life because you need a job, because you're in debt, because you have credit cards, because you have student loans, because that's what everybody does. And so you do it too. That's what's wrong. What's wrong is that we don't, like... We don't give – it's like we met, let them figure it out on their own, and it fucking takes forever. It, takes for, it took forever for me. My, the only thing that I had going for me was that I was crazy and that I had been spending most of my high school years fighting so that I was already so far outside of anybody that I – I was so weird. I didn't fit in yeah, anywhere. I, I was weird too. Isn't that funny? I didn't feel like I had a pot I, – I knew one thing. I couldn't work. Like a regular job. Like I had to figure out something else. Because like, there's the idea of, it was literally the idea of being in an office was like torture. Okay, can I just tell you, so that's the hinge point. The difference between you and this. So, so here's, if I, was, if I was creating a fantasy educational system, the hinge point between what you just said is that you said, I couldn't stand this, I couldn't work the real job, I couldn't fit into this, so I did something, I had to find yeah. another way. A lot of people get stuck with the so I had to find another way part. Yeah. Right? Um, you know, it's funny because, you know, your kids are young enough, too, so you went through this. But, I mean, when my kids were really young before they were in the school they're in now, we put them in one of those Montessori schools. You know, the ones How that say— How are those? So, like, everybody goes together? It, 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 no, it's, it's, it's different school to school. But, but the basic concept is that you don't force the children to learn anything specific. You have all these things around, and the children go to what they want to do. 
Um, so the upside's obviously that from the get-go, they're only reading what they're into. Or the downside, of course, is that there's all this other stuff you're supposed to, to learn. It's the, di- it's the dichotomy between how do you, you know, you, you had talked about needing to have these skills, little math skills. You need some basic yeah. foundational stuff. But something is also happening at that level, which is you're finding out which students are into math and would like to have a career in math. Other people are being touched by a foreign language in a way that they think, I'd like to learn more. I'd like to speak it fluently. I'd like to teach it. So in a way, you're already beginning to select what kids are into by exposing them to this stuff. Most of us find it boring, but there might be something. That's where I first found history as a as a discipline, right? If if. Most kids say, oh, God, the last thing I want to hear is some history, but I get turned on by it. Okay, well, well then it's worth right. exposing you to all those things. Um, I think the problem is, though, is that it would be great, for example, to have half your schooling, maybe at that young age, be a, sort of a Montessori model where you say, okay, we spent our time on reading, writing, and arithmetic. Now we want you to go around, and it has to be, you can't be playing video games unless playing video games is what you want to do for a living and you're going to be able to, to do some educational work on it. But, I mean, I would love to see more of a fostering for the fact that, listen, we're trying to create entrepreneurs here rather than trying to create drone workers on the Amazon assembly line. Now, if you end up on the Amazon assembly line anyway, great, good for you. I'm glad you can bring some food home. But the goal ought to be to let you start a business and maybe employ a bunch of other people, you know? Yeah, and the goal would be to have less unhappy, dissatisfied people. Because it creates a more stable yeah. society. And, well, it also happier. Yeah. It, it creates more more satisfaction. The people that I know that get to do what they want to do for a living, it's not like they're, their lives are completely happy. Everybody's going to f- face right. problems, yeah. no matter who you are. Absolutely. You know, what? What? what did, uh, it was a Kanye West who said, do rich people have problems? They're just different problems. I mean, it's, it's everybody's got these challenges. But like you said, there's there's not a lot more, more stressful than having a ton of credit card debt, wondering, you know, if you're going to lose your house, wondering how you're going to pay for your kid's education. I mean, all those things are soul crushing. Not only that, because you're in debt, you get nervous. So it suppresses your ability to, to express take risks. yourself and take risks. Yep. Because you're, you know, cycle. you don't want to lose your gig. You don't want to, you know, it's like, man, this, and you're tired. there's no way to live. You're tired. Yes. I mean, yeah. the one thing is, as you get older, I mean, it's funny because um, getting older is one of those things that you can only understand when you get there. So I, all through your life, you're going through these, God, isn't this, isn't this the interesting part of being in your 30s or being in your 40s? So as, as I go into my 50s now, I'm sitting here going, energy is so under talked about yeah you know the ability to like my buddy who who wrote me and said you know i feel like i screwed up my life i I didn't take enough chances i i played it safe and now i'm so unhappy he says and i just can't motivate myself at 50 years old anymore energy wise to start over energy is underrepresented it's hard he's got to fix his health I knew you were going to say that. That's See? what it is. Your health is your engine. Yeah, your your it is. health is literally the the chassis, the tires, the brakes, the engine of your vehicle that you move through this life with. And too many people don't pay attention to it. The, ener- the lack of energy is a killer. And as you it's, get older, especially. It's not just that. It It changes your ability to do things. If you don't have energy, not only will you not have the energy to pursue things, but you won't. You won't be able to do them the same way. If you have energy and enthusiasm and say, like, you're healthy and you want to write a book, you're going to have thoughts that will come into your mind that won't come into your mind if you're exhausted. Agreed. And that's fucking huge. That's huge for anything you're trying to pursue, whether we're talking about furniture making, whether we're talking about being an author, whatever it is. Let's talk about ideas for a minute, because I think that's another one. When we talk about small businesses or starting as an entrepreneur, you know, I'm one of those people that is not sure that we don't have a finite number of ideas to each of us. And all of them are valuable enough, even if they don't appear to be on the surface, to write down. Yeah. Yeah. you know, I, I, as a matter of fact, I keep. I went to a business meeting a couple years ago with one of these TV guys I was just talking about, and we go to this business meeting, and you know, we're all on our phones and whatever. And he pulls out an old-fashioned journal that you write in, and he just starts writing. And I looked at that, and I thought, in one sense, he looks like a dinosaur. But <sighs> I went out and bought one, and now it's crazy how often you know all I do is write ideas in it, and. A lot of them I I look back on now and I go, okay, that's still stupid. But other ones I look back on and go, God, I didn't know what this idea meant at the time. But five years later, this idea is really, you know, I guess what I'm saying is that if you wanted to take almost like a religious view of it, God only gives you so many, write down and cherish the ideas. But there is something to that. Folks, what really is going to make you unique sometimes is the way your brain works differently than anyone's brain who's ever existed on the planet. 
that's valuable right there. Write down what comes out of the brain. Um, because well, you capture those things. Yes, because capture if you don't them. capture them, they will slip away. And, and, slip and, away. and, and sometimes, sometimes the idea isn't good until, you, until the second half arrives later. Yeah. Right. So idea number one is in your book from five years ago. Idea number two that finally completes that idea arrives later. I mean, I had a friend who was so creative and he said he gets the best ideas at night. So he just turns on the, the, the light at the side of the table, writes it down in the book. And by morning, there's another idea down there. Yeah. And quantity has a quality all its own. And sometimes a book filled with interesting ideas out of your individual unique head will help you later on. So write them down. Yeah, you have there's no to. downside. I have uh, an app on my phone where I can just, uh, you know, the notes app. You yeah. use that sure, where sure, it has right. a little microphone. It's filled with I stuff. talk into that thing. I do too. And it dictates it really almost perfectly. So I'll have an idea and I'll just be driving down the road. I just press that button. I start talking into it and then I put it down. I got it. Like I got that one. I captured it. Think about people who had one fantastic idea in their life and, yeah. bu and built their whole life on it. Yeah. And you never know which idea that's going to be. And you know what? I, I was an improv Again, you know more about this than I do, but I was a theater major for my first two years of college, and we, we did improv comedy. And the guy who taught us improv in high school, really, he had a great line. He said, that part of your brain, like every part of your brain, is a muscle. Mm. And he said, the more you're thinking, okay, i got to show this Friday that I have to come up with something funny for, the better you get at it. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's, you, you start looking. Your brain starts looking at things and finding things. So you're almost like training it to help you now in this new endeavor. It's a very plastic sort of an approach. But, but it's the same thing with the ideas. One idea in your little book that you wrote down could make your life, your child. I mean, if you're Henry Ford, mm -hmm. I mean, how many people did you employ for decades afterwards because of a good idea? I mean, yeah. our world is built on those things. And also, like, the idea of having these ideas and the enthusiasm that comes from it, like, it starts to escalate and you start to calculate like oh and i need more and i need this and maybe that and and then the the motivation and the momentum of these ideas can lead to enthusiasm and, and you that, attract other people who mm -hmm. who can add and i mean the, the, this is what we said about like you start your website and you just do it because things once you push the the, the verb of living manages to create ripples and you know get a little bit metaphysical here but ripples in time in front of you that open up possibilities and because someone may you know if you only have one podcast listener but that podcast listener is like, wow, that's great. I'm going to, and gets a hold of you, and you, your life goes off in another different direction. But you have to try. You yeah. have to try. Yeah.